Okay, this is lesson 15. Um, we are going to be talking about our first art history um, examples here. This is going to begin um, really as early as it goes in the Bronze Age, and we will just sort of move from there. So to, before we actually get into the art that was made during the Bronze Era, um, I just kind of want to talk about a little bit of art history and what art history is and how it differs from other kinds of history. Um, it does differ from other types of history because we still see the works from the past um, evident in the present. Um, we have the artifacts directly there that were made and created during the time that, you know, they existed. Um, a more one-to-one -one communication can occur through art history because Again, we don't need language to understand the artwork necessarily. Um, we can look at the images. We can look at the, you know, what, what is present in the artwork to understand what was trying to be communicated. Um, it also is a glimpse into our lives of preceding humans. Um, I've, I've talked about this a few times before, especially in like our early on lessons, but um, art is a, you know, direct connection to a point in time in history, um, whether it is today, you know, and we think about the artwork that is being created now and how it will be perceived in a hundred years. Um, you know, it, it all is like a reflection and a glimpse into what was happening at a certain time. And we can better understand the society, we can better understand the culture um, through seeing what they valued enough to depict in artworks. Um, and that there's no objective better in comparison, in comparison, comparing societies or even art of different times in the same society um, than, you know, looking at the artwork that was there. So with the Bronze Era, um, this is just a map of the different Paleolithic sites and early centers for civilization that we're going to talk about. Um, we're mostly going to be focusing in the Bronze Era in like this little area right here, like Eurasia and Africa. Um, and that that's where a lot of this stuff, this early examples will take place. Um, let's talk a little bit about this early period called the Paleolithic period, and this is before even the Bronze Age occurs. Um, the Paleolithic period is the earliest that we have as far as like, you know, documenting this artwork. Um, there are these crude stone cutting tools that are roughly 2 million years old that we find in East Central Africa. And the imagination of the advantage, the imagination that we see here is an obvious advantage that we start to see over other types of species. Um, there's refinement of these tools made from stone and then the awareness of form and function um, is making them symmetrical. Um, we also see the pigmentation from sprinkled powders and beads that accompany different burial sites. And here's an early on example of, you know, a picture from one of those, those like cave drawings. Um, there's really a debate about when, so we, we see these tools and we see these, you know, materials here, but there's really a, a debate about where art started to get into that conversation. Um, we see this piece of engraved ochre from about 77,000 years ago. Um, it shows more of an abstract pattern and unlikely used for anything practical other than, you know, showing imaginations, showing creativity. Um, and the Paleolithic art that we see, the earliest findings of it begin about 40,000 years ago. So here are some uh, images, some slides that you are going to need to remember for our finals. Um, just letting you know, I try to always give you a heads up if like an image is going to be important. Um, the stone period, um, this is found during the Paleolithic period. And um, it, it consists of a lot of these smaller like stone figurines that we see here. Um, the Hall's Fells pit figure is the oldest surviving carved human figure statue that we have. Um, it was worn as a necklace. It's fairly small. It's probably like two or three inches long, but we start to see a lot of these like little like women body vessel um, structures early on. And we, we can assume that it was made for a like, religious or symbolic purpose, um, such as, you know, being a symbol for fertility, being a symbol for, um, you know, power, for luck, you know, whatever it might have been. This is the woman of Willendorf, who she's a little bit farther along than the the whole spell. Um, but I, we just want, want to show this one to show the earliest example that we have of it. Um, but this is probably the more recognized, um, like little figurine sculpture from the, the stone period that we have. Um, she's similar to the other female features, 
Um, there are similar exaggerations here. And this is also sort of an interesting example to see, you know, as our like standards for beauty change over time, you know, what was seen as beautiful hundreds, if not millions of thousands of years, you know, thousands of years ago um, is not what we think about as being beautiful today. So here we can kind of, you know, get the idea that this figure is, you know, seen as probably, um, you know, being wealthy enough to have enough food to, you know, have a bigger belly, to have, you know, strong legs, to have, um, you know, breasts that could feed children. Um, and so these exaggerations here are, you know, I think today would be considered like not our ideal beauty standard. Um, but, it, you know, it, the way that beauty standards change over time is really interesting to see in the artwork because, you know, more than likely the ideal body is going to be the one that these people think to paint because it's, you know, it has value to it. Um, and so I, I think that's another interesting thing just to look at throughout history is like how different figures are painted and how they are sculpted um, to represent the the trends and like the, you know, the patterns that we start to see. So just some food for thought there. Um, so let's move on a little bit. As far as painting goes during the Paleolithic period, um, paintings rarely show humans, which I think is really interesting early on in the Paleolithic times. The oldest known paintings are found in Indonesia, um, and they're found only decades ago, only like, you know, in like the late 90s is when we see them. Um, it dates to around 40,000 years ago, and this example we see here in this cave is a pig deer, which is now extinct, but we start to see that there's, you know, this, this form and this body and you know, different things that depict this specific creature. More paintings that we see, this is probably the most like known um, like set of cave paintings. It's the Chabet Caves in France. Um, only discovered a few like decades ago, just like the other one. Um, it's more recent, better preserved. Um, so essentially these hikers that were hiking in France um, came upon this cave and it was uh, preserved by this big giant stone that was rolled in front of it. Um, and so when it was opened, it was preserved exactly like it was from that time period, the same air, the same, you know, everything, the same conditions. And so it allowed these paintings to be, you know, almost in mint condition. Um, the wall paintings are all of animals and they're painted with charcoal and earthen pigments. So used to, when they first discovered the Shavet cave, you could go and like, you know, be a tourist and go in it and, you know, look at the paintings yourselves. However, they started to realize that the longer the cave was open, the faster the paintings started to deteriorate. And so now they only allow some people in once a year to check the integrity of them to see how things have changed, see if there can be any type of like further preservation from the caves and to like reconstruct it. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it was, it was perfectly preserved. These are photographs from the cave itself. And, you know, these are thousands of years old. Um, so painting, just kind of going into the principles of it, the purpose of naturalistic Paleolithic art is debated. Um, it's long believed purpose was to bring spirits of the animals into hunt related rituals. So, you know, if they were going on a big hunt or, you know, it was, you know, something in regards to like their livelihood they would depict them in their artwork to sort of like, you know, summon them or to bring them on and to bring them luck and, you know, these journeys they were going to have. Some experts theorize that these sites were more so sanctuaries, um, but both theories are very plausible things. Um, while much art is found in caves, also some is found above the ground. It's just not as easy to have been preserved. But this is some old uh, rock art found in the um, like Utah desert. And it resembles humans wrapped in symbolic garments. And it shows a really high degree of detail as well. So moving on from the Paleolithic, we have the Neolithic period. The shift from the Paleolithic period is a major turning point in human history. Um, it may have started to happen in modern day Iraq. And there's this huge agriculture revolution that requires um, storage in some form of clay pots. So I think that's something that's interesting for here and, and looking back at our architecture lesson as well. Um, Paleolithic times are more so where we are living in caves. We are not our architecture and our, our sort of like, I guess, um, where we're at societally, um, is not, 
you know, really grouping together, staying in one place for a prolonged period of time. It's just more so survival mode. Whereas in the Neolithic period, we start to say like, you know, oh, we want to have some longevity. We don't want to just like, you know, make it until our next meal type of thing. We want to preserve our different like foods and um, you know, liquids and storage, just different things. And so we need some sort of vessel to store those in, which is why we, you know, develop these clay pots like this. Um, we also start to see some more like abstract work done here that really it has no purpose seemingly other than for the design and for the aesthetic form of it. Um, some more Neolithic art, the motifs are derived from plant and animal forms. So we start to see more sort of like an abstract, um, like patterns and, you know, different cultures kind of taking on their own styles as well. And, you know, probably passing those traditions down and those styles down. This is an earthenware beaker from Susa. Um, and we see that there is an abstracted design. Um, they're triangular and circular shapes as well as this like goat figurine here. Um, but the form of this is really great. The symmetry is great. Um, and so we, we really start to see a lot of good development here. Um, some more Neolithic pottery. This is pottery from China. Um, this is a burial urn. So instead of having like these big burial sites, sometimes we would, you know, like cremate instead of doing that. And so, you know, to have this big urn here might be something that is used for that. Um, there is very bold interlocking designs on this and the design is probably driven from the bottom of these cowrie shells. So I'm sure you've seen a shell before that has sort of like this sort of loopy pattern to it um, when you look on the inside there. So although this is an abstract pattern, it is derived from something in nature, which a lot of this stuff is it's, you know, they, they're they getting their inspiration from things that they see in their daily life. Some architecture that we start to see, um, Neolithic structures, um, Stonehenge is a big one that comes from the Neolithic time. It's very sophisticated. Um, and the replacement of wooden structure is with stone now. So, you know, it starts to become more permanent. The function of this site is very much debated. It's probably a site for funerary rites, but mo that's the most current theory. But it could have had various functions. Um, and it probably was a lot bigger at one point as well um, with, you know, materials that have since eroded. But you can see this picture doesn't really do it justice, but that um, post and beam method is, is what's being used here. So finally, we get into the Bronze Age or Mesopotamia is, is like the, the area that we start to see the Bronze Age emerge. And this is like the bottom of Europe, um, you know, Middle East, part of Africa, you know, all of that. Um, it is civilization um, is, is a term that starts to sort of like define this time period. It's a term that distinguishes cultures that have complex social orders and high degree of technical development. Um, some elements that come from the Bronze Age and from Mesopotamia is the agriculture and animal husbandry. We start to see occupational specialization. We start to see the development of language and writing um, and the production of bronze, hence the Bronze Age. So Really, with um, the Bronze Age and Mesopotamia, um, we we're we see like the Paleolithic as being very much in survival mode, very much like a standalone individual state of mind. Whereas, you know, Paleolithic we start to be or Neolithic we start to be more concerned with like staying in one place and like you know not migrating as much, creating vessels that sort of thing. And then the Bronze Age really just takes it to that next level where it's like, okay, we're not going to migrate. We're going to you know set up like a station set up a a civilization in this one place and then move around it instead of just having to move ourselves around the you know animals and the the herds and you know that sort of thing and we also start to see you know the raising of animals instead of just having to follow them we start to see the people are not having to do everything not having to do the hunting the cleaning the cooking all of that but you know there might be one group that's taught to hunt and there might be one group that's taught to make the vessels that the you know meats and things are going to be kept in to you know keep for winter and you know all of that so yeah just really um a lot of a lot of like kind of explosion of stuff is happening here um, Sumer, this is the earliest known civilization and historical region of the southern Mesopotamia area. This is um, a sac the sacred mountain leaking the heaven and earth. This is our big like compound that we see here, sort of like in a pyramid style. Um, 
we see that the material here is these sun-baked bricks forming a platform on a solid base with a shrine on top. So, you know, that that dry masonry here and probably, you know, this has actually like been uh, not just stacked, but in some way, you know, solidified in between the bricks um, so that it, it, it stays intact as well as it has here. There's a lack of stone that led to the use of brick and wood for building materials, but brick, you know, is, is a pretty strong material as well. Um, and very little Mesopotamia architecture still remains, but this Sumer here is, is, is still very well intact. Um, art served for more like ritualistic needs during Mesopotamia time, Bronze Age times. This is the vase of Warka. It's one of the earliest examples of narrative relief sculpture. So we talked about relief sculpture early on, but this is not pigmentation. This has actually been carved into this vessel. This is a celebration for fertility and depicts humans in harmony with the natural world. All right. Um, and I've kind of left out Mesopotamia is more so let's get back to our map. This is all Mesopotamia right here, all of this area. And so we see like this little bridge almost that leads us into Egypt. Whereas now, you know, that wouldn't, we have planes and we have, you know, boats and things like that wouldn't be as big of a cutoff, but Egypt was sort of set, like their, their culture is also developing very rapidly during this time, but it's a little bit separate from Mesopotamia. So, you know, a lot of these same things, the agriculture and animal husbandry, occupational spirit, specialization, writing, production of bronze is still happening in Egypt, but they're doing it a little bit differently than, than the rest of Mesopotamia because they're cut off from it. So um, there is little outside influence due to the geography of the region. Egypt is able to develop distinctive Bronze Age styles with their architecture, painting, and sculpture, and their style remained relatively unchanged for about 2,500 years. Um, the architecture that we see, the Great Pyramids, obviously Great Pyramid, Pyramids of Giza, um, it's built as a burial vault for pharaohs or god kings. And um, so they're, they're kind of like, you know, uh, religious and like um, spiritual beliefs were we had these god kings or like pharaohs that were in between like humans and gods. And they were sort of like this this bridge or this like you know, look into for humans, you know, what the God world was. Um, and they really valued that. So obviously these pyramids here are created to honor them and to, you know, respect them even in the afterlife, because they did believe that like, you know, after the body dies, like your spirit still remains on. Um, we see the great pyramids. There are these really complex systems and interior, um, like passageways that we see. Um, but it's definitely not somewhere that we are like housing people. Those are still more, I would imagine, like you know, smaller structures than these. Um, some sculpture and wall paintings that we see in ancient Egypt. We see this style of more like compact, solid structural figures that embody qualities of strength and geometry. Uh, there is similar examples in their architecture as well. This is a Pharaoh Minakura and um, two goddesses to his left and his right. There is a strong attention to the human anatomy more so than our other examples that we've seen that were more abstracted. Um, but there is also a geometric scheme as well. So it's natural, but it still feels quite rigid in some areas. Um, the frontal pose is reserved for royal portraits with the left foot forward that we see right here. Um, a really good like iconography example. Um, the Egyptians are really well known for their iconography, like every position, every, um, you know, slight little move or head turn or imagery that's seen here is is probably representing something more than just meets the eye. Um, this is the mask from the tomb of Tutankhamun. He was um, one of the most well-known pharaohs. It's the only tomb to have remained intact until modern times. And we see the use of inlaid gold here. So usually like over the pharaoh's head, they would place this to sort of like protect it and preserve it even further. Um, these like giant masks that were, you know, very insulated. Um, some more sort of wall paintings that we see and like just painting in general, lots of iconography that we see in the background here. Um, this is a wall painting from the tomb of Nebamun, who was another pharaoh. Um, the flat shapes are portraying elements of each subject, and um, there's clear non-confusing shapes being used. 
um, a hierarchic scale that we've talked about in our like principles of design, but really great example here of showing that the Pharaoh is like the biggest figure in the page. And then, you know, as it kind of goes down, we start to see like a, a, the hierarchy that is, that is seen here. Um, the, and, and that's always symbolic. There's also an attention to the detail of animal life that we see all throughout here. And it also includes hieroglyphs or like the iconography that we see in the background that was um, in some way their language. Okay, that is the end of lesson 15. Um, we will jump back in and our next module and um, resume our conversations on art history.